let's get into the message. Um, Advent isn't something I grew up celebrating. Uh, I don't know that most Baptists do. It's not really necessarily a thing that most Baptists do, but that's okay. If you're not as familiar with it, it just simply really means arrival. And it is about celebrating more than just Christmas, but the arrival of Jesus. And so it is kind of formally celebrated over the four Sundays that precede Christmas in anticipation and celebration of the coming of Christ, the arrival of the baby in the manger, right? We got the manger on stage with us today. We love the baby in the manger, the little eight pounds, six ounce baby Jesus in the manger. We're a big fan of that. But um, as we celebrate this, an, another aspect of it is usually candles that signify these different weeks. And the first candle is the candle of hope. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning is hope. I love Christmas the whole season. I, I love Thanksgiving too. I know that they've kind of gotten overlapped and some of you get really snippy about uh, celebrating Christmas before you've properly celebrated Thanksgiving. We actually put up our Christmas tree on Thanksgiving Day this year. How many of you already have Christmas decorations up? Just like in the first service, most of you do. That's, that's fantastic. I, I don't think there's any reason to get snippy. Let's just lean into it. We've got two holidays right against each other. And honestly, this whole season that we get to celebrate uh, the things we're grateful for, and honestly, the things that matter the most to us personally, but also that have the most significance. Um, for me, celebrating Advent together makes a lot of sense, and I think you'll agree as we make our way through these messages over the next few weeks as the anticipation builds. For many, when they think of Christmas, they also think of the man in the red suit, Santa, right? Right? And some of you have Santa decorations, and then you also have your really, really, really religious friends who remind you angrily that Jesus is the reason for the season, not Santa. And then you're like, oh yeah, it is about the baby in the manger. Carrie, you mentioned that earlier, but there's more to it than the baby in the manger. There's more than just the shepherds and the angels and the wise men. There's more to it. And what I mean by that is that if you approach Christmas and begin your celebration in the manger, you're coming in in the middle of the story. And, and things are going to happen right at the beginning of the New Testament that aren't going to make sense if you don't understand the whole story. You're coming in in the middle. Why are these angels announcing the birth of this baby? Why are these shepherds fearful? Why are these wise men on this inquisitive journey? Why is King Herod freaking out? What is going on here? Because there's more to the story. It's like walking in in the middle of a movie. People are saying things and doing things and you don't understand it. And, and some of you have a family member like that where you all sit down to watch a movie and they decide to walk in after 30 minutes and go, what's going on? And you're angry now because you're, I'm not catching you up. We told you we were starting the movie. Or they just weren't paying attention, right? Why did he say that? Who's, who's, who is that? The beauty of Advent is that we get to take a look at the big picture. We can take in the whole story and appreciate all of the beauty of the Christmas story. Because it didn't begin in a manger. It began way before that. It began a long, long time ago in a land far, far away. Let's go back, okay? Genesis chapter one. We have the story of creation. God speaks the heavens and the earth into existence. He creates the sun, the moon, and the stars. He forms the animals that walk the earth, the fish of the sea. He creates all of them. And we'll pick up briefly in chapter one, verse 26. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. So God creates all things and then he creates man. And in chapter 2, verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. God creates all things. 
mankind as the prize of his creation. He places him in the garden, gives him his instructions to care for it, to work it, to eat of all the trees except one. And that is fantastic. That's Genesis chapter one and chapter two in very, very brief form. And then you have chapter three. And in chapter three, everything gets sideways. Satan comes in the form of a serpent. He tempts Eve and Adam and Eve disobey God's one and only rule. They sin against God by eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know this story, right? God comes later to walk and talk with them, but they're nowhere to be found because they have eaten and their eyes are open. They realize they're naked and they stitch fig leaves together to try to cover themselves up. And in their shame, they hide from God. And God calls out for them. And he says, where are you? And then he says, what have you done? You've you've eaten from the tree, haven't you? Who told you you were naked? When their first instinct is that we were naked and we were ashamed and we, we hid. Who told you you were naked? You've eaten. You've eaten from the tree I told you not to, haven't you? They feel shame. And then in chapter three, it says, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. And then he says this, I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Now, at first glance, if this is all you read, you might not realize, might not think much of it, but there's something remarkable going on here. This is the beginning of Christmas. The beginning of the Christmas story isn't the manger, it's in the garden. The beginning of the story is actually 4,000 years before we have the baby Jesus in the manger. When you think about Christmas, as a child, what comes to mind? Maybe it's the decorations, maybe it's the celebrations, maybe it's the lights. For me, it's the presents, right? It's the gifts. Um, I, I, our Christmases were never extravagant, but I always got something that I wanted, right? I always got something that I wanted. As, as kids, and, and maybe even still as adults, you make a wish list, right, every year of the things that you want. I've seen my kids' lists. Um, they add to them daily. Daily, they're putting things on the list. And honestly, Christmas as we know it is very much centered around what we want. It's centered around wants. But I hope that you're going to see today that that's not where it began. When God created the world, everything was just as it should be. Creation functioned perfectly in the order according to God's design. Man walked in unbroken relationship with God. We have chapter one and chapter two. He's placed in the garden. He's given the one rule. I don't know how much time elapsed between chapter two and chapter three. If you roll right out of chapter two into chapter three, you might think that it was like that later that same day, the serpent comes and tempts. I don't know that it happened that same day or that same week or that same year. I don't know how long they lived in the garden. Honestly, I try to think about it. I go, you know what? I think I could resist the one tree for at least a few weeks because I've got all these other options. And maybe Satan knew that. Again, I'm, I'm reading between the lines. Maybe he knew that. He's like, I'm going to wait, maybe see if they get a little bored with the thousands and thousands of options they have. And then I'll tempt them with the one. I don't know. We don't know how much happened, how much time happened between there. But all we do know is that when they sinned, when they took the bite of that fruit, whatever kind it was, in that instant, everything changed. As Adam and Eve disobeyed God's good instruction, they took the fruit, they ate it, and sin entered the world. And it broke their fellowship with God. It shattered peace. It threw creation into chaos and darkness and depravity and fear and shame. And all of those things would now flood the earth and flood the human heart, separating us from God. In that moment, in that instant, the situation went from perfect to tragic. 
It went from perfect, amazing utopia to a very dire and ugly and dark and hopeless situation. But right then, in the middle of the darkness, God speaks a word of hope. Genesis 3.15, the verse I highlighted earlier. Scholars refer to it as the Proto-Evangelion or the first gospel. That promise that I will put hostility between you, your offspring and the woman's offspring and her offspring and you are gonna have this hostility, this enmity. And he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And again, if you don't know the full context, you don't think a whole lot of it. But there was a promise there. In the middle of all of that, there would be consequences that come from the sin. He he lays it out for the serpent and then he talks to Adam and Eve and says, here's what the consequences of your sin are gonna be. The brokenness, the darkness would grow. God knew it would get worse. If you think that moment is bad, it actually does get worse. Keep reading in the book of Genesis. Eventually, you run into a guy named Noah. Y'all know about him, right? What did he do? Built the ark. Why? Because God flooded the earth. It actually says that things got so bad that God looked down and he grieved or he regretted having made mankind. It, It broke his heart because it said that every thought and intention of their heart was against him. Things were bad in the garden, but they just got worse. And God knew it was going to get worse before it got better. Even after he lays out for Adam and Eve what their consequences are gonna be, it's gonna be harder to do the work that I've created you to do. For the woman, you're gonna bear children, but the pain in your labor, it's gonna increase. And now, you're going to desire your husband, but he's going to lord. What does all of that mean? He's going to lord over you. There's even going to be difficulty within the relationship between a man and a woman that wasn't there before. They had a perfect marriage. That's been the only perfect marriage that's ever happened was Adam and Eve before chapter three. Ever since then, there's been hostility between, (laughs) you think I'm going to say the husband and the wife, not necessarily. There's been hostility between the offspring of, between Satan and, and between Jesus Christ, who was going to dominate him, but there has been this struggle in our, even our marriage relationships. He lays all that out for them, and I'm sure as they take it in, they don't understand the gravity of the situation. They don't understand how bad it actually is, but God does. And his first instinct in the moment where they sin against him, they had one rule and they broke it. His first instinct was to show grace. That was the very first thing he did. Even before he laid out the consequences for them, he speaks to the serpent first. And the reason why is because in what he says to the serpent, he's letting them know, hey, here in a minute, I'm gonna let you know how bad it is for you. But before we get there, you need to know this. That's not the end of the story. One day, someone will come, Jesus, the baby in the manger. And when he comes, don't get me wrong, The devil is absolutely going to strike at his heel. We see that on the cross. But as he strikes at his heel, he's going to crush his head. He will do damage. There will be death. The Savior will lay down his life, but in his death, he will overcome death. He makes this promise. So much of what we do around Christmas, what we write and dream and sing about at Christmas centers around what we want. But through Christmas, God gives us what we really want by meeting our deepest need. Everyone wants grace and mercy and forgiveness. And in the garden, I can guarantee you that what Adam and Eve wanted most was for everything to be put back the way it was before. It's a really sad scene to see them led out of the garden and God actually puts an angel there to guard the entrance so they can't get back in don't you know every night as they cried themselves to sleep 
I just wish we could go back. I just wish we could undo it. What they wanted most was grace and mercy and forgiveness. What they wanted most was for somebody to fix it. And everyone wants that. We all want to believe there is hope. And you may argue with me on this, but I believe even the most negative, critical, cynical person you know wants to believe there is hope. They may not show it or say it. They might come right out and say the opposite. They may say there is no hope. People don't change. Situations don't get better. Everything's stacked against me. But inside what they want is for there to be hope. But life and people have proven to them over and over again that it's hopeless. They just can't see it. But even under that hard shell, they really want to believe it. And here's the thing. That person I'm describing may be you. Now, you may not be vocal in it. But inside, you may say, well, honestly, from what I've seen, I just don't know if there's much hope for me or the people around me. Carrie, have you seen the world? With this pandemic, we don't even know what to believe. I mean, honestly, Carrie, even truth is under assault. People are more divided. There's, it, it's getting worse. There can't possibly be hope. But inside, you really want to believe that there is. That's why it's so important that we realize that the manger isn't the beginning of the story. It's, if anything, it's the climax. It's the fulfillment. The music rises to this moment. The angels sing to celebrate in glory. This is the high point of the story that began 4,000 years before. You think Christmas takes forever to get here. I'm going to be honest with you. As a child, the longest period of time is from December 26th to December 25th. It takes longer than a year, I guarantee you. And I have a February birthday. So I get Christmas and then my birthday, and then it's forever before I get anything again as a kid. Right? It takes forever. It was 4,000 years from the moment that God said before. I'll get to you in a minute, Adam and Eve, to the serpent. Know this. You think you've won? And there's going to come a moment where you're going to really think you've won. You're going to strike his heel and then he's going to crush your head. Four thousand years prior when mankind had absolutely blown it, when it couldn't get worse, when it feels like they tripped right out of the gate with shame overwhelming them and pain on the forecast, God offers hope. Is that how you see him? When you think of God, is that how you view him? That his first instinct is grace? Or do you see him as cruel and vindictive, waiting to curse you, out to get you? If I trip up, he's going to get me. He's going to curse me. Or maybe you just see him as aloof. He's just completely uninvolved in your life. He doesn't seem to be doing anything for or against me. I don't think God could care less about me or my problems. Because if he did, he would do something about them. But at the start of this story, which is the beginning of the Christmas story, it's also the beginning of the whole story. God showed his true colors. Before we ever knew we were broken, he promised to heal us. Before we ever knew we were lost, he put in a plan in place to find us. Before you or I ever made our first Christmas wish or wrote our first letter to Santa, God promised to give us what we really want most. And he gives us what we really, at, the, at our heart level, what we really want most by meeting us at our deepest need. This is the heart of a father. I try to think how I would react. I've created man and woman, I've placed them in the garden, I've given them a perfect setup and I've given them one rule and it appears as though they broke it relatively quickly. What's, how do I respond? 
really? You had one rule. You couldn't, you, <laughs> you couldn't keep one rule? You couldn't keep, I tell you, you know what? You don't know that later on, I'm going to give like 10 and see how they do with that. But to start right out of the gate, I give you one. That's not what he leads with, is it? He leads with hope. I thought this week, imagine myself. I don't yet have a teenager. Um, I'm just weeks away from Jackson turning 13. I am not fearful. But I imagine um, my 16-year-old son, he gets his driver's license. And this would be very uncharacteristic for Jackson Luke. Um, But let's just say he sneaks out one night and he takes my car. And I don't know, I'm unaware, I'm I'm out cold, I'm asleep. The only way that I find out is that my phone rings at 2 a.m. because he's been in a terrible accident. And he's at the hospital and I rush to his side just before they take him into surgery. And the first thing I say to him is what? I can't believe you did this. You'll never drive again. You're gonna pay for the damages, right? That's the first thing I say to him, right? No, the first thing I say is, this is gonna be okay. We'll take care of this because that's the heart of a father because that's what you would do in that situation, right? You don't lead with anger. You don't lead with, you're grounded. You're, I'm taking away everything. You're never gonna see that. You don't lead with that, right? Right? In the moment of their greatest need, you meet them with grace. I have seen my children's Christmas lists. There's not a single need on the list. And you may say, well, nobody wants a, you don't want a need. I mean, honestly, that's part of what it means to grow up, right? You start to understand the difference between a want and a need. But I've seen their list. There's no needs on there. I didn't go down through and say, what I'd really like is a a year's supply of toothpaste. It's just not on there. They don't, they don't list the needs on there. Do you know why they don't list the needs? Because I supply the needs. And our heavenly father, even though just like Adam and in the garden, we have blown it. We've tripped right out of the gate. The first chance you got to sin, you took it. You were little. And you just keep, you keep doing it, right? I'm gonna clean myself up. I'm a grown, I'm a, but then you keep sinning. And where does he meet? He doesn't meet you with damnation and with curses. He meets you with the cross. Hey, there's going to be consequences. Man, you've made a mess of things, but understand this. This isn't the end of the story. This is just the beginning. Because Christmas didn't begin in a manger. It began in the garden. It actually began with hurt and pain and mankind blowing it. And God promising to make a way to fix it. And I'm going to tell you, you, whether you're a child or adult, you go ahead and make your wish list for this year, the things you really want. And understand this, they're all just shadows of what you really want at the heart level. You want everything to be okay. You You want the pain to stop. And you want, if you really could, you would love for all of the bad things that you have done to never have happened, to become untrue. You would love all the bad things that have been done to you. If what you really want, if I just say you can have anything you want, I'd love it for none of those bad things to ever have happened to me. And for me to, to never have happened as those bad things to perfectly good people. And that is exactly where God meets you. He goes, Oh, I can take care of that. I can't undo the bad. I can't undo them. You, you, there are consequences to your actions, but understand this, that's not the end of the story. I can, and I can take the broken and I can take the mangled and the messed up and the hopeless and I can, I can make that brand new. And that was a promise that was fulfilled in the manger, but it was made Thousands of years before, thousands of years before you were ever born, God had already made a way 
for hope to be very real in your life. And my prayer today is that you will see it in a fresh way. As we make our way through this season together, that it's not just about Christmas morning. It began way before that with a God whose first instinct was to show grace and to give us hope. Let's pray. God, that is who you are and it is seen throughout. We don't always understand. I would actually go so far as to say we rarely understand, but every now and then you give us a little glimpse. God, your process, thousands of years between the promise and its fulfillment, but you fulfilled your promise. And there are many of us today, we're on the other side of the birth of Christ, the life of Christ, and the death of Christ on our behalf. And we know that not just was it fulfilled in the manger, it was fulfilled on the cross. The promise of Christmas made in the garden wasn't finished in the manger, it was finished on the cross where sin, where the devil striked out against man and mankind. One final blow. But in his death, Jesus Christ crushed the head, overcoming death once and for all. So God, I don't know how hopeless the situation may be for somebody who's listening to me today. Maybe it actually just feels like it's gotten worse. This year hasn't helped. Maybe it's in their own life. Maybe it's in the life of someone they know and love. And they're honestly to the point now where they're like, I just don't think that there's any more hope. I pray that today you will revive it in them. That the promise of hope will be more true to them maybe than ever before. God, even though we've made a mess of our lives and we get, we get the opportunity maybe for a do-over and we just mess it up again. And Father, you always meet us at our point of greatest need. Thank you for Jesus. It's because of him that we sing, we celebrate, we open this word each week, not just during this season, but all year long. Thank you for being a God of grace. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you guys stand? Let's worship together. I'll dwell in your house, oh Lord, I know that I am safe here with you. And I run, I run, I run to your goodness. And I dance, I dance, I dance in your presence. And I lift my hands for all that you've done for me. Fear may come, fear may come, but I am true. In the Father's arms, I am secure. Battles raging inside my heart are one I know, but I am safe here with you. Sing, I run, and I run, I run. I run to your goodness And I dance, I dance, I dance in your presence And I lift my hands for all that you've done for me and I run, I run, I run to your goodness And I dance, I dance I dance in your presence and I lift my hands for all that you've done for me. And in the valley, and in the valley all alone, 
in pain, I'm weary and I'm broke. My God won't look away, Father, my heart will say that I am safe here with you. And I run, I run, I run to your goodness, and I dance, I dance. I dance in your presence and I lift my hands for all that you've done for me. And I run, I run, I run to your goodness and I dance, I dance, I dance in your presence and I lift my hands for all that you've done for me. Amen. You guys can have a seat.